Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. In this show, we're gonna talk about reading the water or how to find trout in current. It's not an art and it's not a science. There aren't any intuitive gifts a human can possess to help him or her find trout in a stream. And there isn't really any science that can pinpoint trout locations in unfamiliar waters. The best we can do is guess. Nobody's gonna give you a map to a trout stream with little red trout pinpointing on it, showing you where the trout are gonna feed. That's not gonna happen. The best we can do is use a little bit of knowledge about where trout want to feed, where they want to live, and also tempered with your experience on other more familiar waters. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing Yellowstone Teton Territory Crazy Rainbow Ranch Adipose Boat Works Global Rescue Trout Unlimited Oscar Blues Brewery Sometimes, you don't need to bother learning to read the water. If you fish the same river every day, or even once a month, you learn where trout feed by experience. If trout are visibly feeding on the surface, you already know where they feed, and you can at least get an idea of how many are around. Even if you don't catch any, the next time you fish, you'll have a good idea of where they live. And if you fish with a guide, you're paying for that person's knowledge of the water and where to find fish. We've all heard stories of giant trout that live in the deep pool by the bridge. And often you can see them down there, 10 feet under the surface, lying next to a rock or log. And you know what? You'll almost never catch that fish because a trout in 10 feet of water is not feeding. It's resting, sleeping, or hiding there to stay away from anglers and swimmers on a hot day. There's little food at the bottom of deep pools. Few insects, crayfish, or baitfish. It's a desert and good only for one thing, staying away from predators. You can occasionally tempt an inactive trout with a reaction strike to a streamer, or you can slap a nymph in its face, hoping they'll wake up. A trout that has been spooked by a potential predator like you won't feed at all. But a trout that is actively feeding is a more reliable target. And thankfully, most trout are on the feed throughout the day and sometimes into the dark. When you don't catch trout in a likely place, it's usually a matter of the wrong fly, the wrong presentation, or you've been too sloppy with your waiting and casting and you've scared them. So why do you need to learn how to read the water? Well, trout aren't gonna be everywhere. Uh, in many rivers, trout are only gonna be in maybe 10% of the stream bed or the wetted area of the river. So you gotta narrow things down because if you don't, you have to fish everywhere and you drive yourself crazy trying to fish everywhere. Even in smaller creeks, you may have to walk 100 yards or more to find a place that may hold a trout. It's not very confidence inspiring to fish over a piece of water, not knowing if you're even fishing over trout. If I could sum reading the water up in one statement, it would be this. Trout like to feed in water that is from two to four feet deep, in velocity somewhere between one and two feet per second, close to moderate to fast current, and with a place to bolt to for protection close at hand. That's it. But the devil's in the details. You have to look for places that combine all of these elements, not just one or two of them in isolation. The two to four feet deep part is pretty easy. If the water's clear enough, structure on the bottom of a river begins to look a bit blurry at a depth of about two feet. And you can typically see deeper water by color changes. As the water gets darker, it's deeper. If the water isn't clear or the light is difficult, you might have to guess, 
but under most conditions, it's not that hard. Looking for the main current threads is not that hard either. Of course, you can see the current plainly in faster areas, and a good plan is to concentrate on the edges between fast and moderate current, called seams. In slower water, or in the middle of a flat pool, it's not that simple. But if you look for the line of bubbles and tiny debris on the surface, you'll find trout close by. That debris line also carries all the insects that have hatched in the riffles or have fallen into the water, so it's like a road map to feeding trout. Always look at that shallow inside, inside seam before you wade into it or put the boat into it. Yeah, I think, I think that brings up a pretty good point, Tom. A lot, especially out of a drift boat, I notice a lot of folks, you know, they pick what they think is kind of the prime location and they forget to approach it much like you would wade fishing where you'd fish the inside edge yeah and then move and fish the middle mm -hmm. and possibly move again and fish you know out into the current sea more they you know instantly go to the what they think's the best spot versus kind of covering it all yeah The one foot per second part is not as easy to visualize. It's not like you can carry a current meter around and inspect every little current seam. I've used one, but it's more for research so I can understand this stuff. It's about the speed of a slow walk along the bank, and with experience, you'll learn how to spot this speed of flow, especially as you'll catch most of your fish in current of this speed. But rivers seldom have uniform flow from bank to bank, even if they look uniform. And it may be just a matter of inches from one current speed to another. And that's just on the surface. Currents also vary by depth. And obstructions in the water can form pockets of slower water that we can't really examine. We just have to estimate and visualize how subsurface currents vary. And that's where a little knowledge and lots of experience come into play. Later, we'll get into a little more detail on how that works. But for now, just appreciate the wide variety of current flows in any given stretch of river. Oh, there's a fish along the side of the rock and a nice, looks like a rainbow too. Wasn't behind the rock, he was along the side. Whoa, beautiful fish. Cover is important to trout, but I think its importance is overstressed. Trout need cover somewhere close, but they'll often move from a place where they're safe to more exposed areas to feed. And why? Because when they feed, they look for that Goldilocks water that's just right. Not too fast that they exhaust themselves holding in the current, but fast enough to bring them food at a decent rate. That cover should be within a short swim away, but trout don't always feed from within that cover. The closer they can find that perfect current to cover, the better. But I've seen trout feeding 30 feet away from their refuge if the current speed is just right. Cover is not just a log jam or a rock. Deep water, where they can't be seen or attacked by a predator, makes them feel safe. Riffles are another place where the broken surface of the water keeps them relatively invisible to birds of prey and anglers. Shade also provides cover, and many anglers say that trout don't like bright sunlight. But if food is abundant and there aren't many predators around, trout eagerly feed in bright sunlight, so don't rule it out. So when you look at a stretch of water for its trout holding potential, look for that Goldilocks current with cover a quick swim away. This helps you rule out some places in a river where the current might be right, but it's a long swim to shelter. Next, we'll go into a bit more detail to that all important subject of current and how rivers vary and where trout will hold. Some knowledge of hydraulics, at least at the basic level, is important for a solid understanding of reading the water and finding trout. Let's look at those basics, and also about how all of what you've learned about reading the water varies depending on what kind of river you're fishing. When water hits an object, 
the molecules that bump into it stop moving, which creates a chain reaction of molecules bumping into each other, so a cushion of slow water forms in front of an object. Trout can use this area of slower water to hold their position. As water flows around the rock, the hydraulic jump, or change in pressure, creates turbulence behind the rock. Because the bottom of a stream bed is not perfectly smooth, turbulence forms and the water slows down as you get closer to the bottom. The rougher the bottom, the higher this area is. So in streams with a rough bottom, trout have more potential places to live protected from strong currents. All other things being equal, a rough, rocky bottom will be more productive than a bottom composed of sand or bedrock. Current is also slower closer to the bank than it is in the center of a river because of friction between the bank and the current. And the rougher the bank, the more pockets of slow water that can hold trout. In very fast rivers, sometimes the water along the bank is the only place trout can hold and feed comfortably. Although turbulence slows the downstream progress of the current and forms pockets where trout live, you can get too much of a good thing. Where turbulence is so strong, it forms large swirls in the current, trout are less likely to be found because it's just too much. Trout get pushed around by the swirling currents, and because these currents are unpredictable, trout have trouble intercepting their food. So look for more gentle turbulence, where the swirls are no more than an inch or so apart. In fact, that's another good way to find trout. They really like areas of relatively uniform flow with a little chop that is not broken up by big swirls of turbulence. These are places some anglers call soft spots, where the water is fast enough to provide current, gentle turbulence, and uniform flow. Soft spots are also places where it's easier to catch fish because the gentle turbulence hides our mistakes. So I'm nymph fishing up in here for landlocked salmon. We're at Grand Lake Stream in Maine. Figured I might as well try some nymphs in here. And I've been picking up fish in this water right in here where it's kind of uniform. And then, um, you know, when you get down into this stuff down here where, it, where the water seems to boil, I never find fish holding very well in that kind of water. So I'm trying to concentrate in this more uniform water as opposed to the water just below it, and it seems to be working out. Seams. If you learn nothing else about reading the water, look for seams, which are boundaries between fast and slow water. You'll invariably find trout there. Trout can lie in the slower water where they don't waste energy holding in fast current and dart into the swifter water to pluck the abundant food the current brings to them. Rocks in a river, or jumbles of rocks, give a trout everything it needs. There is usually protection along the sides of the rock, and the current is slowed by the rock. Rocks and other obstructions in the river. Most people put their flies behind rocks, downstream of rocks. You can do that if you want, but you're going to catch more fish if you put your flies in front of rocks so they drift in front of the rock or along the sides. The reason is you can, you can tell by this rock that I've got over here, um, all the food gets strained from the current. The current's running on either side of the rock and the rock is blocking it and the fish aren't going to feed behind that rock because there's nothing there. There's nothing at all behind that rock. It's a dead zone, whereas there's going to be food drifting in front of it and along both sides. And there's also a little cushion of slower water built up in front of a big rock because when the water molecules hit each other, they, they hit each other and they back up and they slow down. So there's actually often a little trench that's dug there and a really great place for a trout to hide. They can dart along the sides of the rock or behind it when they get frightened, but where they're gonna feed is probably in front of a rock or along the sides. Believe it or not, the area just behind a submerged rock is not always a good place to find trout, especially in fast current. There's just too much turbulence there and trout may have trouble holding their position. You'll be more likely to find trout quite a distance below a rock where turbulence lessens, but the break in the current formed by the rock is still present. The distance downstream of a rock you'll find trout depends a lot on the speed of the current. The slower the current, the closer trout will be to the rock. In fast current, they may hold quite a distance behind it. Submerged rocks may just appear as subtle disturbances on the surface. 
be aware that the actual rocks will be located above the swirls because the downstream progress of the current pushes them below the actual object. Bends in a river almost always make better places to fish. Nice seams form, and a pocket of deep water forms a pool because the turbulence digs a trench on the bottom. In general, if the water in a bend is flowing swiftly, trout will be on the more protected, slower water on the inside of the bend. Let's take this little spot for an example. So we have a bend in the river, and you might expect the trout to be over against that far bank, but the current's really too fast there. It's not that one foot per second that, that trout like. So the trout are gonna be more on a fast bend like this, are gonna be more on the inside of the bend. And then if you look at the water here, you see that there's no rocks over here in front of me. Um, it's just sand bottom, kind of gravelly sand bottom is where the fish are gonna be. So you just look in here and you can ignore lots of water over there and just fish on this inside part of the seam. Oh, it's a big brown trout, I think. Wow, that inside seam would Use a little side pressure to see if I can move him. That is a big brown trout. Acting like a brown trout. <laughs> Maybe if I get him in this in this mud here, he'll get a little disoriented. <laughs> I'm gonna bring him up into this shallow water. Oh my god, what a beautiful brown trout. The old inside of the seam. You would have thought that fish would have been over against that fast water, but he was right in here. All right. So let's see if we can get that hook out of you quickly. And I'm gonna bring him over here into this clear, shallow water and release him. Bye, buddy. Thank you. Mm. In slow water, the inside of the bend may be devoid of food because the current is not fast enough to bring trout a constant food supply, so they may feed on the outside of the bend where the current is a little bit stronger. Next, we'll look at some larger features of a river, pools and pocket water, and where you can expect to find trout in them. We'll also explore the kind of water you might want to pass up. Many rivers don't have distinct pools. Others have many of them. The first place most of us look is at the head of a pool, where a fast riffle dumps into slower, deeper water. If the head is formed by a gentle riffle, the entire lip of the pool, where the riffle drops off and slows into deeper water, may hold fish from one side to the other. Where the faster current rolls over the shelf between shallow and deep water is a pocket of slower water where trout can hold comfortably. The broken surface of the riffle protects them from predators, and the faster current above brings a lot of food. I've been amazed at how much I've learned playing around with a current meter. I'm here where a riffle dumps off into a little pool, and the water at the surface here is almost four feet per second. But as I push this down just a little bit below the surface, that velocity goes down to less than a foot per second to the point where it's almost zero at the bottom. So just this little lip at this riffle can mean a big stratification in currents, leaving trout with a comfortable place to live underneath that shelf. In really fast pool heads, you often get a whirlpool effect where the current, because of turbulence, curls back on itself and actually flows in an upstream direction. Trout love these places, but just remember that they may be facing downstream. So plan your approach and your presentation accordingly. One of the first places to start when you're fishing is probably the head of the pool, especially if there's nothing else going on, if there's no hatch. So first of all, you've got the fast water tumbling into the pool. 
and at the very top of that, it's probably a little bit too turbulent for fish. You probably wouldn't find any right in there, but as that white water starts to flatten out, there's gonna be a little depression in the current, and that's probably where a lot of fish are gonna be feeding. And then all the way down through that thread of current, all the way down, um, should be where the fish are lying. Now there's a couple sneaky little spots in ahead of a pool. One is this seam on the near side here. Um, it's the boundary between fast and slow water, and that's often a really good place that people miss. And a place that people miss even more often, because it's tougher to fish, is the seam on the other side. The, there's slower water at the edge of fast and all the way down through there, that's a really good place to find fish. A lot trickier to fish the far side, but that's a really good place to fish as well. The middle of a pool, especially a big pool, often seems like a big flat nothing with no structure and no place to look for fish. But if you look carefully, you can find the spots. First, look for that foam line that indicates where the food will be carried through a pool. Second, look for spots along the bank that offer shade or protection. Third, look for swirls on the surface that might indicate submerged rocks or weed beds. And finally, remember that two to four foot deep rule. In really deep pools, look for the shallower spots. In shallow pools, look for the deeper spots, indicated by water that is a bit darker. So in the middle of the pool, it's tougher water to read. There's not as many immediately apparent places where you might find trout. But if you look carefully, you'll find those little pockets. So we've got a middle of a pool here, kind of flat, um, not many features there, but there's some things you can look for. The first thing you want to look for is that main current thread that goes down through the pool. That's going to have a bubble line and you're going to see that debris and bubbles. That's where all the food, all the insects, everything that falls in the water is going to eventually be drawn. So the food's going to go down that bubble line and feeding fish are going to be concentrated under that bubble line. Another thing you want to look for on the near bank, here you can see there's a line of moss or weeds and that kind of delineates the faster current out there from the really slow current in here. This is kind of this is kind of stuff you might call frog water and you you seldom find fish in here unless there's a really heavy hatch and they might move into that slower water. But generally the fish are going to be more concentrated toward the center seam where the bubble line comes. And then yet a third place is the far bank. This bank here is kind of shallow, it's kind of slow, but the current is more concentrated toward the far bank. And if you look carefully, you'll see little, little bays and pockets on that far bank where those rocks are. There's some weed beds that stick out. Any of those little promontories will probably hold feeding trout, uh, especially just in front of those little promontories. They tend to be for some whatever reason, the fish tend to be a little bit in front of those little bays as opposed to in the middle or in the back. So always look at the far deeper bank or the deeper bank might be on your bank too. But look at the bank carefully and look for those little bays and depressions and things that stick out on the far bank. So the tail of a pool is one of the best places to find trout, especially big trout. It's also one of the most difficult places to fish. The water is usually flat, the fish can see you, and there's drag problems because the current is picking up speed. So it's a difficult place to fish, but it's a great place, especially during a hatch. So what do you look for in the tail of the pool? Well, again, you look for that main current thread, and in the tail of the pool, that is not quite as important because what happens in the tail of the pool is that the water constricts vertically. It gets shallower and it also often constricts horizontally. So all the food that's coming down through the pool gets channeled into the tail. So it's an easy place for fish to feed because all that pool gets kind of concentrated into a three dimensional V. Almost every place in the tail of the pool can be good, especially during a hatch. During a hatch, a lot of the fish that are up in the deeper water in the pool will drop down into the tail to feed and they can be found almost anywhere in the tail. However, there are also fish that live in the tail of the pool throughout the season. 
So what do you look for there? Well, you look for some structure. You look for maybe uh, little riffles on the surface. That indicates there's probably some rocks on the bottom. So there's a place for fish to be protected from the current. And that big rock over there is a great place. Just in front of that big rock is a place you would probably find one of the best fish in the pool because the fish has got some protection there. That rock is actually gonna slow the current a little bit in front of it. There'll be a cushion in front of the rock. And if you look carefully, you can see there's a second rock in front of it. So that little spot in front of that big rock on the other bank is probably one of the best places in the tail of the pool. Also, this little seam up here, there's a little seam just above that rock on the far bank. That's also a good place. And then, and then down here in the main tongue of the tail, fish will drop down into there to feed. Because drag is often an issue in the tails of pools, the parachute cast and the pile cast are often handy to give your fly a more natural drift. Let's invite Orvis casting guru Pete Kutzer to show us how to make these casts. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer with the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today I'm going to talk to you about two great downstream presentations you can do with a dry fly or a nymph. Those two presentations are called the pile cast and the parachute cast. The parachute cast is a great cast when we have a fish rising downstream and what we're going to do is stop our rod abruptly making a good cast and then raise our rod tip up. When we lift our rod tip up, we want to make sure we do it before that fly lands on the water. By lifting that fly rod up, we now create a bunch of slack in the line where we can slowly lower that rod down, giving a nice drag-free drift down to those fish. The parachute cast looks like this. I'm gonna make a nice natural cast. After I stop, I lift my rod tip up before that fly lands on the water. Now I can begin to lower this rod down slowly at the speed of the current. This is gonna give me a nice natural downstream presentation with that dry fly or with that nymph. If I do it in the current, you'll see that that fly floats down nice and naturally. And I can float that fly down and if I have to make a longer presentation or I see another fish rising a little bit further down, I can flip out a little bit of line, extending my drift even longer just by making these little flips, pulling off a little bit of line. This is a great presentation when you have downstream fish. With our pile cast, what we're gonna do is we're gonna change our trajectory. We're gonna send our loop uphill and then lower our rod down. By doing that, that's gonna create a bunch of slack in our line allowing us to get that nice drag-free drift downstream to those fish. Now, when we do that pile cast, we wanna make sure that we don't get too aggressive when we drop a rod down. If we do that, it's gonna pull our fly back towards us and cause a lot of slack, giving us potential tangles. And also, if a fish takes with all that slack, it's gonna be difficult to set that hook. With that pile cast, I'm gonna send this loop uphill. I send that loop uphill, but then I drop my rod down. By dropping it down, that gives me a little bit of slack and my fly floats down with a nice drag-free natural drift. So send that loop up, drop it down gently, and now you get that nice drift. And that's the pile cast and the parachute cast. This is what we call pocket water. And pocket water is just a bunch of rocks with a lot of foam and a lot of swirling currents. And trout love pocket water because there's lots of little places they can tuck in and live and feed. So what do you look for in pocket water with a lot of rocks and foam? Well, first thing you look for are areas where the river kind of flattens out into a little plateau. That means the current's gonna slow down a little bit. it would probably be a little deeper. So you just kind of scan down through the pocket water and look for little places like that one down there where the water kind of plateaus and, and just looks a little flatter than the rest of the water. Next, you look at the foam. Trout are probably not gonna be immediately under the foam. The foam indicates a lot of turbulence. The trout have trouble holding positions in that turbulence, plus they can't see their food coming. So you wanna look for areas that aren't as foamy as the rest, where the, the water's kind of, kind of cleared out of foam. Trout are often gonna be located around rocks because the rocks offer some protection from predators and they also break the current. So, um, you know, you wanna look for trout close to the rocks, but where exactly do you wanna put your fly? 
For instance, this rock below me here has a really nice cushion in front of it. There's a little deep bucket in there, and when water hits a rock, it slows down in front of the rock. It forms a little cushion that's protected from the current. So you can see the little, little cushion in front of that rock. There's a nice little deep bucket here, not too much foam. Um, that would be a good place to find a trout. A lot of people like to fish right behind rocks because they figure it breaks the current, right? But often you won't find trout immediately behind a rock. You'll find them back a little more. And that's because as the water comes over the top of the rock or around the rock, it forms a lot of turbulence behind that rock. And again, it's a place where trout have trouble, trouble holding their position. How on the other hand, as you get further down from the rock, that turbulence starts to lessen. You have some break from the current. So you're gonna find trout you know, a few feet to 10 or 20 feet below a rock in the middle of the river. Finally, let's look at how to eliminate some water types. You don't have the energy to fish everywhere, so knowing the kind of water to walk around or row through will save you some frustration. One thing that'll help you learn to read water is to learn what to avoid. So there are a couple things you wanna probably skip around when you're reading the water. Um, one would be really flat, featureless water with no depth and no protection, a shallow riffle with no depressions, no rocks, no anything, just a shallow riffle, kind of flat with no breaks. That would be one thing. The other kind of water that you might want to ignore is a little bit less intuitive, but it's water that, like this that I have behind me that's a chute. It's running really fast, and although it's probably deep enough for a trout, there's just no protection from the current down through there until way down until we get in front of that rock. So this water here, uh, you know, there could be a trout in there, but it's a low percentage spot. Whoa, that's a nice fish. There's even more to finding trout in rivers than just looking at rocks, currents, and pools. I've given you just some brief guidelines of how to find trout, and in a future show, we'll explain this even further, including the difference in species and how finding trout changes during the season. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Adipose Boatworks. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. Oscar Blues Brewery.